Welcome back to Joyful Journey. I'm your host, Reverend Carol Dickey, and it is so good to be with you today. Um, I have a special guest, my husband, Dr. Dan Dickey. Um, I've asked him to come on the show so that we can talk about something that's really um, in the news. Actually, it's everywhere. You might be sick of this topic by now, but we do feel that um, although we hear a lot about it on the news, we don't hear about it from a biblical perspective. So that's what we want to bring to you today, and we want to discuss racism and the church. Not in the church, because hopefully there isn't any, but racism and the church. What is the church's stance on that, and how do we combat that in the spirit? Because you know we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and high places. And, and we, the church, fights the enemy with prayer with the word, with fasting, um, with supplication. There are ways to combat this, but we want to know seriously, what does the Lord think about this? So, Danny, thank you so much for being with me today. Um, thank you. I know we were talking about this at home, right. and we thought it would be a really good subject to bring to everybody. And um, actually, it was, your, it was your suggestion, so. Yeah, I felt that it's something that Christians specifically Christians need to address Amen. in the world and you know in the instances of those who claim the name of Christ yet exhibit prejudicial tendencies and yeah. th that unfortunately that happens in the, in real life more often than not and so I felt like we should say you know why is there racism what is the core of it what causes it right you know where is its origin of course, the short answer to that is sin. Sin. The Amen. sin nature that's present in the flesh of man, even in a Christian, you know, because we war against our flesh, mm -hmm. can cause hatred and division because, after all, hatred is obviously of the devil. Well, let me, let me stop you right there because I think that is um, what I really wanted to bring to this message today was we are seeing so many protests and so many things happening because of... Um, racism or the perception of racism in certain cases and and there's a lot of anger uh, rightfully so I believe there's there's so much going on but the way in which many are handling it is not within the framework of righteousness exactly. but of course so many people um, that are protesting and are are really um, bringing this to the forefront now are, are good people but they are not necessarily Christians so they are fighting with weapons that they find, that they have, which are, you know, um, our, our rights to protest in certain things. And in some ways, they're, they're uh, finding very uh, destructive ways to get their message across. But we as a church, we, when we stand up for racism and um, against racism, I should say, we have to do that within the framework of being a believer and working within the guidelines that the Lord and the Word has given us. Yeah, so yeah. that's what we want to address today. Exactly. And the scripture says, be angry but sin amen, not. Amen. Amen. Yes, we should be angry. We should be righteously indignant and angry at racism. And, and, and why is that, do you think? Um, I thought about this for quite a while and I realized that the basic problem, like I said, besides the sin nature is Racism is an insult to God. Amen. It Amen. is saying to God, you created an inferior That's or right. defective thing or person, and I don't like it. You shouldn't have done that, or I don't like right. what you did. And like Job, the book of Job says, who are you, O oh man, Amen. who answers back to God? How, how dare you judge That's the right. creator of all things? Everything God saw when he created, he said it was good. Uh, Genesis 131, God saw everything, everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. That includes the people that you don't like. That's right. That includes me, you, the dog, the cat, the moon, the stars. Everything. God liked it all. He said it was all good. So we have no authority and no business That's right. in judging what That's God so has true. created mm -hmm. and saying it's not good. Amen. Amen. What else do you have there? Uh, one scripture, that, or several actually, First John uh, that I brought to mind. He that loves not knows not God. That's right. For God is love. 
Since God is love, hatred can't be hated. Right. God can't be hatred and love. Now, biblically, there are sins that God says he hates. But, but those are sins. But those are sins. Not people. Not people. And God says, I love everyone. God so loved the world, John 3.16. He loved everybody. He wanted everybody. He's not willing that any should amen, perish. Amen, amen. So there's no human being on earth or ever been on earth or will be on earth that God doesn't love and want to save. Uh, the other scripture that uh, from that book that's uh, very prominent in this discussion would be the one that says, you cannot love God and hate your brother. Yes. For the one who does that is a liar. You, you are a liar to say you love God. If you love God, how can you hate his, your brother? I, and it also says, how can you love God whom you have not seen, yet hate your brother whom you yes. have seen? So let's just put this into perspective. Hate is not from the Lord. It is not godly. It is a not, not a godly uh, reaction. We, even the Lord, hates the sin but loves the sinner. So even... Um, Exactly. Some people who are actively involved in lifestyles that are not from the Lord and um, or, or doing things, uh, you know, so many times Christians think that to lead somebody to the Lord, they got to clean their act up for as far as sin or whatever, and then they can come to the Lord. So let me just say this right now. God takes us as we are, as we are, and then he does what he wants to do with us. Okay. You will never be cleaned up enough of your own no, effort we can't. to come to God in, in your own righteousness. But here we have a pharisaical attitude that, um, and we see it so much with Jesus in, in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, where the Pharisees are always coming and saying, why are you sitting with these sinners? Or why are you um, dealing with these people? They have a, a holier-than-thou attitude. His answer is beautiful. Yes. Too, is those who are sick need a physician, Amen. not the well. But... We, which is all of people, us. Yes, but some people have taken the sin aspect out of it and just um, focused on people, on persons that they don't like, whatever their attributes are, whether sins involved or not. Something about that person, uh, whether the personality, whether they conduct themselves, their socioeconomic area. Some people hate rich people. Some people hate poor people. There's a tendency among. Uh, Christians and the unsaved to suggest that your sins are worse than mine. Yes, but no, they're not. <laughs> and then, so we, we have people that uh, irrationally, <coughs> let's say, um, dislike other people for something that they have no control over. Okay, you cannot uh, help where you were born. You cannot help the color of your skin. You cannot help the color of your hair or the color of your eyes. You cannot help many times um, your body shape. I mean, yeah, you could diet, but, but so many so many things are inherited. So many well, things yes. are already in your DNA, and people are predisposed to dislike you because of the way God actually made you. That fits in with the, the next little statement I, I have here. Racism is not something we are normally born with. I don't think so. I mean, yes, it's sinful, but toddlers, babies, don't exhibit any racism. Right, You'll yeah. see babies of all colors playing together. We've all seen little videos where kids wear black and white and brown. They're having mm -hmm. a great little time playing with their blocks and things. It's something that's taught to us when we're small. Parents, caregivers, and other adults. And in that respect, it's genetic because it comes from our parents, not in the physical DNA sense of genetic. It's in nurturing rather than... But, but it's in the environment that we're, they're, we're placed into. They were taught it the same way by their parents, mm -hmm. by their parents previous to that, and they're basically passing on an affliction. It's an illness that's contagious because it's given to the other yes, person. Yes, but so many people use um, predisposition as an excuse for their behavior. Right. It's like, not an excuse. No, it's not. Like, there's certain, um, you know, I, I, I even do it. You know, my family's Croatian, which is very close to being Italian, so we're very loud. We talk with their hands. Uh, we're very animated. Yes, I do that. Um, there's certain people that say, oh, I drink a lot because I'm this I'm nationality. Irish. Yeah, I'm I, well, I didn't want to say it, but you are Irish, so you can say I'm it. Irish and German. Um, so, That's a yeah. Problem right or there. <laughs> no, there's certain kidding. things that they think, or, or, I um, I drank because my father was a drunk, 
Right. Well, I hate to say it, but my mother was an alcoholic. Um, yeah, so was mine. Your father was an alcoholic. Yes. We don't drink. Right. Um, so, and my parents both smoked well over four packs of cigarettes oh, yeah. a day. Both of, both of them died from actually smoking cigarettes from their related illnesses. And the power I don't of, smoke. The power of Christ can change anyone from what they were exactly. into a new creature. So even though you might have that and you might have been brought up in that sure. kind of environment, well, the let's just put it this way. you If you're a Christian, you are now in the family of God. So right. you don't have any explanation. That effect is not, you're not the same person that was taught that. No, so you don't have an excuse that, oh, my family was like this because your family is now the family of God. Interestingly enough, I mean, I will admit that I was brought up in a family where my father was very prejudicial, very bigoted, towards individuals of other skin colors and races and religions and everything else. I don't know if it's the era I was brought up in, you know, being brought up in the 60s, the, the mantra mantra of the 60s was uh, question authority. Right, and, and so, he does. And I do, I still he do that. He still does. I, yeah, I really do. It's terrible sometimes, but I, you know, as much as I respected and loved my father and the things he did as a provider for a family and all that, I could never accept that. Well, you recognize it. I recognize it as false. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is because I lived in a multicultural area. Right. I had friends of all colors, and he would say things and that contradicted the truth yeah, that I knew observed. Them, you knew them to be. It's untrue. like that can't be right. Mm -hmm. That's not true. They're not this way. They're just people, you know. And I even had several incidents in life where I got into some trouble for defending my perspective, if you will. That's a long story, but nevertheless, I just felt like something was wrong with that. Of course, it didn't it is. make sense, and that's before I was a Christian. Way before that, I just I looked at at the circumstances and the surroundings of what I was being told, and it it didn't. Well, follow. logically, it doesn't make sense. No. But, but that should show you that racism really is born of an emotion. Right. Uh, for whatever reason, there are emotions. So let's go on that because I have some things I want to share with you as well. So um, go ahead with what you're Well, I wanted to note that, you know, uh, some people may be familiar with Proverbs 6 where it talks about the things that God hates. And uh, I made a point that the devil uses racism to sow dissent among the brethren. What better way to separate the white church and the black church yeah, and the brown that's church ridiculous. than to cause some hatred? It's listed in Proverbs 6, 16 as one of the things that God hates. So why does he hate that? Simple. Divided church is an ineffective church. Amen. They can't get together. They can't pray. They can't feed the hungry. They can't visit the sick because they're too busy fussing with one another about things. Sometimes people say that Sunday mornings are the most segregated time of the week. Uh, praise the Lord that we go to a church that's quite well multicultural and it's beautiful. Well, and we it reflects in, a, yeah. in the ministry of the church. It shows. <clears throat> um, I do have a, a minor little uh, illustration, if you will, mm -hmm. if I can give this. To, uh, since God created us all, isn't it logical that he loves and enjoys Amen. all of, of course, us? Of course, of course. God wouldn't make something and say, well, I made you, but I don't like you. That's ridiculous. He would have gotten rid of you yeah. if he didn't like you. Ridiculous. This is an illustration that a pastor of mine years ago gave me. And he said, did you ever get that big box of 64 crayons when you were a kid? You know, the Crayola crayons are like big old box. There's 64 colors. Most of us had that or at least seen it when we were children. And he said, yeah, most of us said, yeah, sure, I got those crayons. And the pastor said, well, did you ever get a box of those crayons and open it up and they were all the same color? No. Well, God is just like that. He sees a need for all the different colors, Man, just course. like the people who make the crayons. Well, wouldn't it be boring if everybody was the same? Oh, sure. They're all God's creations, just like us, and they deserve to be treated as we would like to be treated. What's the golden rule? Luke 6.31. As you would that men do to you, do to them also. Right. Do you want to be hated and reviled for what you are? Of course not. Nobody would say yes to that. Well, guess what? No one else deserves that either. Right. And of course, we're, we're speaking, hopefully, to Christians who believe that. But we're trying to give you a perspective of where does racism come from? Where does it come from? And really, it comes from the pit of hell. That's, That's the only thing. The bottom line. If you can hate your brother for any reason, any reason, I mean, we are to forgive, we are to love, even our enemies. 
you have to, from a Chris, Christian standpoint, if we reflect Jesus and we are Christ on earth, we are the body of Christ, we are the bride of Christ, we better act like it. We better um, be like the good Samaritan who came across somebody who was not from Samaria and he took care of him. And they, Samaritans and Jews, hated one another. Oh, sure. Uh, I, it, it I, went back centuries. I actually have an observation about that that I'd never thought of until I read that story the other day again doing this. Uh, that Samaritan, when he came upon that person who was injured, he must have thought, or it must have crossed his mind that in other circumstances, the two of us coming together would have likely been an uncomfortable situation. They wouldn't spoke. spoken. We wouldn't have spoken to each other. We disliked and hated each other. And knowing that, the Samaritan said, could have said, well, I'm not going to help him. He wouldn't help me. But that wasn't his heart. No. His heart said to him, I'm going to do the right thing. This person needs help. I don't care where they're from, who they are. I'm going to Amen. help them. Amen, and that's the way it Spent should be. Spent his own money, took his own time, poured out his, his healing ability with the wine and the water and the oil, you know, and helped the individual, bandaged him up, knowing that had he met this person in the marketplace or whatever, the person might have rejected him. Well, I think that's interesting because that is a parable given by Jesus. <coughs> And um, most likely, Jesus inserted the Samaritan as a different culture because he was trying to prove a point. If it had been a Jew uh, for another Jew, it would have, wouldn't have meant that much. I mean, he says even thieves take care of other thieves. Sure. Right? But um, not that Jews are thieves. I'm just using that um, as right. an even, even, uh, even criminals analogy. have, yeah. have so he's honor using, for each other to help each other. He's using um, somebody that the Jews well know, because he's speaking to Jewish people. He's, he's using somebody that they well know they don't associate with. Right. And saying that he has done the right thing. So um, the Lord wants to... In, the, in his church and in his people to take out any hatred, any bigotry. and Because um, we have to look. We always think of bigotry as, as uh, racial. But the, you can have bigotry against uh, a lot of different people. Oh, sure. You can um, be bigoted against somebody who's tall or fat or I mean, I hate to say skinny it. or... Yeah, but my whole life um, I've been made fun of because I was blonde. I... Sure, that's you know, a I've heard so many stereotypical joke, joke. Right. right, which irritate me to no end uh, because I'm not dumb. And so I have to, you know, haha, that's really funny. It's not funny to me. They've never been funny to me. Um, you know, there's short jokes, there's Polish jokes, there's, there's jokes about everybody. And um, we have to realize that that is not from the Lord. And so I have a couple things I want to bring to mind that um, as a church, if we love one another, despite everything, despite not just the color of your skin, but despite where you come from, uh, how much money you have, you know, uh, people have problems with if you're poor oh, yes. or if you're, Econ if you're rich. Economic bigotry is a big problem. Oh, it's a huge thing. Um, you know, I know people don't, they think it's reverse discrimination or whatever. It's really not, but I come from a place where uh, whites are the minority. So growing up, um, you were the first, <laughs> first Caucasian I ever dated, and you know that yes. you're your first one I ever dated. I only uh, dated people of other colors or ethnicities, and um, uh, I've experienced some uh, prejudice from the other side because they couldn't understand why anybody would date a white girl, um, and so I had some issues with that. And I, but you know. Everybody's got something. Sure. There's something that somebody's not going to like about you, uh, no matter how you look at it. So you, I want to show you. Even two identical twins have some minor thing. In There's always a better different. looking twin. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> right. I, I find not that fascinating. Me, no. It's just there's one little thing that makes them uh, <laughs> different. Well, there you are. You know, everyone's unique. And you know what's interesting? Because I saw this on a Montel Williams show one time. For those of you who know Montel Williams, it goes way back. There was a DNA test. And this woman uh, didn't know if it was one or two brothers, but they were identical twins. And we waited the whole hour to see who was the father of that child. And you know, at the end of that hour, they couldn't tell us because their their DNA the was DNA is the same, exactly the same. Yet they were twins. They were they were twins, but they were they were slightly different. But they had the exact same DNA. But their I find that interesting. Their fingerprints would have varied. 
Uh, no, they're identical twins. Well, it didn't matter. No. I don't know if that's true or not because they didn't take a fingertip. I mean, they took a DNA right. test to see. Yeah, exactly. But I, I think that's interesting because we, as the body of Christ, we have God's DNA. Right. His, it's His blood. We're a new creation in Christ. Right, but it's His so. blood. So we are all of the same DNA, which makes us all in the same family, and we are all identical as far as who we are in Christ. Not one of us is better than the other one. Not one of us is less than the other one. We are the same. And so I want to just um, show where how this goes back, because if the church is in unity, there's nothing that can stop us. Uh, it goes back to the Tower of Babel, which was in uh, Genesis 11. And this is when all the earth was of one, um, one race, one, one language, because they, remember, they were all from Adam and Eve. And um, in verse 4, it says, let's go build a city and a tower that may reach unto the heaven and let us make a name or will be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the tower and the city where the children of men build. And the Lord said in verse six, behold, the people is one or are one, but it says is one. And they have all one language and this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do so let's go down and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech so the lord scattered them abroad so that's really where all the ethnicity started the lord scattered them he sent someone over here someone over there someone over there change your language because he knew that if we were all in one accord there was nothing that we couldn't do and that's why the church needs to be in one accord acts 2 it says on the day of pentecost all the believers were meeting together in one place and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring mighty wind and the filled the house where they were sitting and then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. And that time there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, they came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. And this is so interesting. In verse 7 and 8, it says they were completely amazed. How can this be? These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native language. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, and Rome, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things of God. Here we have a place where you've got people from all around the world, all around the world, and they're hearing the glorious gospel in their own language through the power of the Holy Spirit. And my point is this. If God didn't want everybody to hear, he wouldn't have started. The very first thing he did when he poured out the Holy Spirit was speak to everybody in their own language. Hallelujah. It's often said that the, the day of Pentecost was the reversal of the Tower of Babel. Amen. Amen. What it, well, what it, it is, is God took everything that he had done previously and put it back together because he had a message for everyone. Right. Well, I, I want to go on to a couple other things. Is that, um, as we know, the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 26 says, and all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city, and nothing evil will be allowed to enter, only those who, who are um, names written in the last book of life but all the nations there are going to be people from all over in heaven in the new jerusalem speaking in different languages in philippians 2 9 it says therefore god elevated him jesus to of the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father he didn't say every mouth he said every tongue, that means every language, everybody around the world, every nation, every tribe is going to hear the gospel and have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ because we are all important. Jesus died for us all. And I just want to, um, cause we're kind of running out of time, but I want to just show that even the early church, which I found this interesting, um, experienced a little form of prejudice because they did have people from all around. Uh, and different areas. In Acts 6, 
it says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, so the church is growing, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So here we have the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, converts complaining about the Jewish converts because they're saying that the Greek widows aren't being treated correctly. So we have here a form where they think they're being mistreated. And so how did the church handle it? Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So what they're saying is, look, we're not going to take this up. We have to proclaim the gospel. So what they did is said, look out among you of seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and that who we can point over this business. But we're going to give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So what they're saying is that's when they elected Stephen, who was the very first martyr. Because what they're saying is, look, this, this shouldn't happen. Um, we don't want to hear it. We are here for one reason, one reason only. That's proclaim the gospel of the Jesus Christ. Purpose. So we're going to appoint somebody who's full of the Holy Spirit to take care of these petty squabblings. So let me tell you this. Maybe it wasn't petty to the Grecians because they felt that they were uh, being mistreated. But half the time it's in our perception and not really what's happening. I don't know because I wasn't there. But I will say this. I know one thing and one thing only. That God's plan is for everybody all around the world, every nation, every tongue, every color, every race to receive Jesus Christ. Amen. It is his desire that everyone be treated like the brother in Christ that they are. And if you aren't doing it, or if you know somebody who is, or if your pastor preaches something different from the pulpit, that I say you better get out of that church because that is not from the Lord. I've heard about pastors recently talking about Jews and blah, blah, blah. No, that is not from God. If your pastor is not preaching the word of God, which says love your enemies, pray for your enemies, everybody is welcome in the kingdom of God, then not the gospel, because the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. That means everybody has an opportunity to receive Jesus. And you have that opportunity right this moment. Amen. If you don't know Jesus and you want to know the Jesus that we are talking about, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. I repent, I turn away from all that I've done that does not please you, and I want to serve you all the days of my life. And God will take that prayer, and he will use it for his glory. Danny, I want to thank you so much thank for you. coming and talking about this important subject. I hope it's ministered to you, or at least brought some clarity. And we love you so much. Until next time, we pray you have a joyful journey. The preceding program was brought to you by the Holy Spirit Broadcasting Network, HSBN Television.